Hello, everybody. It's Reed Tracy, and welcome back to the You Can Heal Your Life podcast. I'm real excited for the, our guests today. We have Dan Sullivan and Ben Hardy, and this, they just completed their third book, and it's called 10X is Easier Than 2X. And I can't wait to talk to them about this. I've read this book like one and a half times already. And it's amazing. It's so, so, so good. I know it's going to help so many, so many people. And the great thing about this book for all of you listening, it's not just for business owners. This works in your personal life as well as your business life. And I want to tell you that up front for all of you who don't care about the business side of things. Um, but it, it works amazing for everyone. So I just want to let you all know that. So welcome, Dan. Welcome, Ben. How are you guys doing? Yeah, thank you, Reed. Um, uh, very gratified by um, um, the response for our, all of our clients received uh, the galley proof on this book. And then we, as soon as the hard copy, uh, copies were available, we sent it out to everybody. And uh, I think uh, of the three books, this has gotten the most immediate uh, impact when people were only like 25% through the book. They, you know, they hadn't completely, usually they finish the book and then you get feedback, but we were getting feedback much earlier in the reading than we have in the first two books. Yeah, it's amazing. I know uh, Ben was uh, down in Mexico giving a talk and he gave the books away, <clears throat> excuse me, to some people that were at the talk. And, and I got like people calling me and emailing me saying, I finished the book, it's amazing. I'm like, how the heck did you get the book? I'm like, what? What's going on? So Ben snuck a few out early too. So mm -hmm. it's a uh, thank you for that, Ben. We always like people reading them early, and it, and the response I got from those people was the same. Like they read the whole book on the plane ride back from Mexico. So it's it's off to a good start. And you guys have a great title to the book. You know, ten x is easier than two x, but. Is it really easier like that? I think that's the best way to start because people see a title like that and they're like, you know, a great title, but can you really do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, well, it's um, in our program, Strategic Coach, this is one of the foundation concepts. Um, the, and uh, just to give a feel for how you... Um, um, get everybody comfortable with this type of thinking. Uh, and my, my entire audience are entrepreneurs, but uh, uh, our entrepreneurs it, it can easily relate this to their family life. They can relate, uh, can relate, uh, relate it to their personal life outside of work. And um, so one trick for this, just to get the interview started here, is with entrepreneurs, I said, pick pick the number that you actually get in your business that's most meaningful. And for most people, it's just the top line. It's just their revenues, you know, and they measure their progress by how much the uh, revenues uh, are uh, increasing. And I say, I want you to do a reverse one uh, 10 times, and I want you to go to the point in the past when you were one-tenth of where you were right now, okay? And they, they can usually peg it, you know, the year that they did that. And I said, so um, how did you get from one-tenth of where you are to where you are right now? And I just arbitrarily say, break it down into five jumps that you took, because usually it's not a steady increase that they have. There are um, uh, there's uh, new techniques that they use, there's new uh, relationships, a sudden great new relationship in the marketplace, uh, great new team members, and, uh, and of course, in this day and age, it's great technology. And, um, and I get them to identify arbitrarily uh, just five stages, and they pick five right away, and then I say, now give some details about that and how it happened. And by the time they're finished, I said, now how many when you were one-tenth, you could even imagine where you are today? 
and uh, very few of them can. And uh, I say, so um, now you're going to do it again, but now you know you, you're familiar with 80 percent of how you did it the first time, and that gives him a um, uh, it gives him a lot of confidence right off the bat. Well, it's not going to change too much when I do it a second time. And I've got clients who have done it three times, you know. And uh, so that's that's one way of grounding it. But then uh, what Ben has done so well in the book is that he's spread it to all sorts of different areas of um, uh, the reader's life. And... Uh, and another structure in our um, coach program, we call it that entrepreneurs are motivated by freedom, and there are four kinds of freedom. Uh, freedom of time, freedom of money, freedom of relationship, and freedom of purpose. And Ben just went sideways with what you can look forward to 10 times better, and that can be both quantitative and qualitative. So I think that that's the framework for doing it. Yeah, I love, like, well, Ben knows a lot about uh, uh, finding this in his life since he has six kids and he's writing all these books. And, he, and I love the illustrations you do, Ben, in there talking about how you apply it to your personal as well as business life. I'd love for you to share some of that with the people because I think it was a really great insight of how you you took those concepts and showed in your own life how you've done it all different ways. And I loved seeing that and really get you thinking of all the things, you, ways you can use these concepts. Yeah, 100%. And um, I look at 10x, you know, a lot of people overly think it's just financial because it's a number, but I do think, I do think about it mostly as a qualitative change, you know. So, for example, like going from crawling to walking, you know, is from my standpoint, a 10x, like you've now gone through a transformation and going back to what Dan was just talking about with freedoms. Now, as someone who can walk, you've got a lot more freedom than someone who can crawl. So you've just gone through a transformation going from, you know, a horse and a buggy to a car, like that's a massive 10x. Um, and so that's one way of looking at it. I think that I'll give a I'll give a few like an illustration or two. But I think to your core question, which is how is it easier? Um, I do think that there's a lot of uh, a lot of insights as well that I love a lot of Dan's thinking and I love a lot of kind of the research that we've brought together that makes it really actually simple and compelling that it truly is a, a much different and better approach to go for 10x versus 2x. Um, but I will give, I'll give an example of my son um, because I think that this is an easy way for people to understand it. So my son is 15 years old. He, he plays high school tennis. So, he, you know, he's on the tennis team. He's a freshman. He's what's called the second line. So in tennis, you've got different lines. And so he's the second line. He's one of the top players on his tennis team. And his goal is to play college tennis. And so, you know, it was probably it was when I was writing the book, but it was like six months ago, he was having a conversation with one of his coaches and his coach asked Caleb, what, what's your goal for tennis? And Caleb said, I want to play college. And the coach was just kind of seeing what Caleb's mindset was. But the coach said, why isn't your goal to go for pro? And, you know, as we describe 10X, I think that that's a 10X. You know, going from college to pro is a 10X different. It's like a quantum leap. Um, and Caleb... Caleb's answer was just, I have no idea. Like, I, he just said, uh, I don't know. Because that was just not his goal, and it was not on his mind. Anyways, when we're driving away from that tennis practice, I asked Caleb, I said, what did you think about what your coach said about you going, you know, you going for pro? I also premised it that, like, Caleb, I don't, I, I, as your dad, don't have any preference whether you go for pro, whether you go for college, or whether you do something entirely different out of whatever you want to do with your life. You can do whatever you want. I just want to know what you thought about the comment. And he's like, I don't know. He's like, it seemed interesting. And then I asked, well, do you think that the current path you're on, the current trajectory you're on right now would get you to college? Do you think that your current path would get you to, to your goal of college? He said, I think so. You know, he's on the high school team. He's in an academy. He practices. He's like, I think so. And I said, well, what about pro? I said, realistically, do you think your current path would get you to pro? And he was like, absolutely not. He already knew a million percent that his current path wouldn't get him to pro. And um, one of the core theories that I kind of was a thinking model to help me with this book is a concept called constraint theory. And it's really a decision-making theory and a, and a strategy theory. It's a business strategy theory. Um, but just to kind of, kind of simplify this and to show you, so we live in Orlando, Florida. And here in Orlando, it's like a tennis mecca. There's tons of tennis all over the place. And truth is, 
there's probably hundreds of coaches, hundreds of programs that could get my son to the college level. Like truly here in Orlando, there's infinite, infinite, there's so much. So the question I have for you, Reed, you know, now this, this is for the audience to listen to as well. Are there more possible coaches that could get him to the college level or to the pro level here in Orlando? What do you think? I think there's more to get him to college than pro. <laughs> exactly. And this is, this is kind of where like the 10X versus 2X starts to come in is in Orlando, there are literally probably hundreds of coaches that could get him to the college level. But realistically, there might be a, a, a very small handful that could get him to the pro level, which actually simplifies it. It makes it a lot clearer and easier to find those few coaches because there's a lot less of them. And that's actually where constraint theory comes in is that higher and higher goals have far less potential pathways or strategies to getting there. You have, you know, and so that actually weeds out a lot of the stuff that doesn't really matter. And, the, and so the, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of it is going for bigger goals actually simplifies the process massively because most paths won't get you there. Only a few of the really best ones. And so it makes it a lot easier to make decisions. Um, so I'll just end there, but um, I mean, certainly there's plenty more we'll get into in terms of the core premises. But yeah, it's it's something that you can do throughout your life. I mean, it's something I've I've ten xed in multiple areas in my life, whether that's my education, my happiness, um, even just you know, yeah. So I'll just stop there for now. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, Reed, you can think of this in terms of. Um, um, moving from your accounting profession to becoming, um, you know, fi- sort of the financial officer for a publishing house. And, uh, you know, first of all, it required commitment and required courage on your part uh, to do that. And I remember <laughs> asking you that I met you for the first time at Genius Network with Joe Polish. And, um, uh, you mentioned that in the accounting firm, the people who went into the publishing company that was right across the hall from you, they seemed like weird people. And and I asked you uh, during the day when you were there, I said, how long were you with the, uh, the publishing company before you realized that the people going into the accounting office where you used to be were actually the weird people. <laughs> and and uh, But that, that normalizing of the new experience is a way of uh, the path to 10 times that uh, you have to have a new normal in your life. And I was just thinking of Ben's example here. So if you, everybody else had uh, coaches that would get you to college, but you were the one person in your age group that was actually had a pro coach, what would that do for your commitment and your confidence that you had better coaching than any of the other players? And that would give you a 10 times mindset advantage that would give you a 10 times uh, greater direction, um, uh, sense of direction. And also, you know that you weren't missing out on any other paths, because there's very few paths for getting to the pro, but they were, uh, their parents were probably looking around, is this the right coach? Am I in the right program? And they probably hop around and that's, um, that actually interferes with uh, going 10 times is never committing to one path. Yeah. That makes sense. I love that. You know, one of the other things that I noticed in the book that you guys talked about is that how the 10x thinking actually frees up time. Like I, I loved mm-hmm. like your example of scheduling free days and and that kind of thinking. And I think that benefits obviously your business mm-hmm. life, but your personal life as well. And mm-hmm. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. I don't care who goes first on that. So, yeah. Well, uh, so I'm in partnership with uh, my lifetime partner, period, and this is Bab Smith, and Babs and I met uh, 40 years ago, and uh, right off the bat, I had some thinking tools very early. I wasn't, we didn't even have a workshop program, it was one-on-one coaching, but I had a particular thinking process that was called the strategy circle. And uh, she said, boy, that sounds really interesting. And she had her own business at that time. And she was in uh, nutrition and uh, massage. 
uh, mostly uh, remedial massage. She had uh, ballet dancers and she had uh, stunt, stuntmen. Uh, Toronto is a big uh, movie uh, city. And she had airline crews, and they have a lot of stress, a lot of tension. And, um, and that was her business, but she had been doing it for about six or seven years. And there wasn't a lot of whole new things that she had to learn uh, to be at the top of her game already. And so uh, I just spent about two or three hours taking her through this thinking process where she picked a date in the future when... Uh, there was going to be massive improvement in all parts of her life and personal life and business life. And, you know, we talked it through and I asked her all sorts of questions that she had not asked herself. And uh, at the end of it, um, she looked at uh, the whole diagram that I had created out of her information. And uh, she says, you know, this is going to be really big. And I thought she was talking about her plan for her business. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, no, this thing you're doing is going to be really, really big. Okay. And I bring that up because uh, two years later, she stopped her business and she became my number one who. Uh, and she said, you know, you shouldn't be spending any time on backstage activities. You should be out in the public talking about this and getting new clients. And that gave us the courage that uh, because I've, when I met her, it was a one-on-one -on -one coaching business. And uh, immediately we began to see um, that I could actually have a whole room full of people. And we had six in the first room and I thought I had died and gone to heaven <laughs> because cause I was more or less getting the paid the, the same I did for one person times six. And I said, whoa, whoa, this is... Uh, uh, big and we went um, I went 10 times just as a result of having someone else as a partner who freed me up so a lot of the 10 times growth is anything that you're doing that isn't really what we call your unique ability then you instead of saying how am I going to do this you say who is going to do this for me or with me and that's um, and that um, you know, and we live our life that way. I mean, in our personal life, we have what's called the four seasons rule. And our four seasons rule is we never do anything in our personal life uh, that we would do if we were staying at a four seasons hotel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and there's one in, uh, uh, there's one in your city, uh, and we we st uh, we stay there, and everything's taken care of for you. You know anything you want, uh, your food. So we've actually taken that four seasons model and moved it in our personal life, so that when we're in our personal life, we're just relaxing and having a good time, so that we're freed up for our business life. And I'll just add one more thing to this. Babs was a big proponent of taking free time, and. Um, and when I met her, I couldn't remember a day when I wasn't working. And uh, she said, well, there's a fork in the road, Dan. And she said, uh, uh, you're either going to do it the way you've been doing it for the rest of your life, or if you're with me, you're going to start taking free days. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, she And you schedule she gave me like 150 to start every year, right? 155, right. 155. But we've had that for 30 years now, so... On the 1st of January, January of every year, 155 days are already off the schedule for work. So each year I just have 210 work days. And every year I try to achieve more with 210 days. And, it, um, and if I take a free day and do work on it, then I have to take a work day and make it into a free day. So it's, it's, uh, it's a rigid... <laughs> It's a rigid model. We can't finish the year with fewer than 155 days. And there again, then you have to have who's who are, uh, and when you're not there and working, you have to have who's. And that's, uh, it was just Babs and uh, Babs and me. And now we have 130 team members in three, three countries. And uh, you know, our, uh, my personal income when I was just a one-on-one -on -one coach and what our total income is right now, you know, is uh, a thousand times, a thousand times greater. 
And uh, so it's been 10 times, three times um, uh, from what we do it. But uh, once you grasp that, uh, if you're thinking about the future at all, it's just a uh, more beneficial and more rewarding if you're always thinking in terms of 10 times. And I have a rule. I'm, uh, I'll be 79 in a few weeks. And uh, my future between now and 100, and I have a full plan for the next 21 years, uh, I'm going to, uh, since I have 70, I've accomplished more since I was 70 than I did before 70. And every decade now, I have a goal that when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm, um, uh, uh, you know, when I'm 10 years older, I will have accomplished more um, since I was 80 than I did before I was 80. So that's another neat little, um, you know, it's an, another neat little measurement thing, but it means that I have to do far, far more after uh, my age right now than I'm doing right now. And it keeps me sort of young. Yeah, I, I understand that since uh, Hay House was started by Louise Hay, and she started Hay House when she was 60. And so she wrote her last book when she was 90. <laughs> she started ballroom dancing when she was like 78 or something like that. So mm -hmm. it goes right along with with those ideas mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, but but Ben Ben can talk because when I met Ben the first time, he was still in his graduate program at Clemson University, his uh, organizational psychology. And he saw getting his PhD as a very, very important credential uh, for his future. And, and uh, actually, when he first phoned Coach uh, to apply for Coach, we said, well, you have to be an entrepreneur and you have to be making this amount of money. And that became an immediate goal for him to um, up his game, you know. So um, I think, uh, Ben, talk about who you hang around with. I think that's, this is a very important part of your 10 times mindset. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, one of the quotes from Dan that I love is, um, you know, always surround yourself with people who, who remind you more of your future than your past. I also love the, uh, another Dan concept is to, essentially partner with or, or align yourself with people who have a very big future. And so um, definitely, definitely really enjoyed that and loved that. And um, I do remember that, <laughs> Reed. Basically, I was uh, doing my PhD and my Aunt Jane was uh, had just joined Genius Network and she was an entrepreneur and she was learning a lot from Dan and she would send me little books of Dan's. Dan has little quote books. And so I started reading them and studying them. This was back in 2014 and 15. And uh, before I even started blogging, honestly, and uh, fell in love with the ideas. And so it's, it's been very fun to go full circle with it. Um, one thing I will say just real quick, read on, on the topic of time and how I look at it. And then you go wherever you want. It, I, I, I really look at, I really look at it from the, from two perspectives. One is flow. And the other one is attention span. So like um, there's a lot of research and we kind of riffed on it in the book that I think really fits Dan's model, Dan's free days, focus days, buffer days model. Uh, a lot of the research on flow is all around either focus or recovery. And, you know, Dan, Dan, I think originally came up with this idea when he was, you know, a performer because he was. Uh, he was in acting and he saw that the performers had focus days where they were like doing their performances and they had recovery days and all the research on flow pretty much backs up that idea that to be a high performer at, you know, you want to have plenty of time for like full recovery in, in the field of psychology. They actually call it psychological detachment from work. But a lot of people don't realize that recovery actually is a key aspect of flow. And so, you know, whether you're taking a day off or whether you're taking a weekend off, if you're actually recovering, um, you're actually regenerating and learning a lot. Even sleep, if it's set up really well, is massive for, for learning and for performance. And so, you know, a big aspect of, I guess you would call it 10x thinking is designing your schedule, designing your life around periods of deep focus and periods of deep recovery. Uh, and then in terms of attention, it really is about less but better, focusing on high quality but low, you know, low quantity of things. Uh, that's where I think you know part of like Dan's philosophy of who not how, where most entrepreneurs or most people in general they just have too much on their mind. Uh, their mind is like at the surface. If you compared your mind to 
uh, the ocean, most people are up at the surface. They're distracted, you know, lots of pings and dings, but also just honestly aware of too many aspects of their job or what other people are doing. And a big aspect of going 10x is simplifying your attention, weeding out, you know, using the 80-20 rule, weeding out 80% of what may already be on your mind and solely focusing on that pure 20% and going really, really deep. Um, this is how you reach a level of quality that 10x, 10x is all about. 10x is fundamentally about first quality, which then leads to quantity. Um, and it reminds me of the, uh, like basically the story of Michelangelo. Michelangelo, when he was talking to the Pope, the Pope basically asked him, you know, what's the secret behind the David, the David statue? And he just said, I just strip away everything that's not the David. And I think that that's a, that's a big aspect of getting to 10x quality. That's a big aspect of getting to 10x innovation is, is if you strip away most of the low level things that hit your attention and you really go deep on just the few things and get really good at it. Uh, I, I kind of think about it as 10x better precedes 10x bigger. And so as you go deep, 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 it really, first off, it simplifies your life because your mind's not scraping a thousand surfaces. You're actually just living a simple life of flow going deep rather than shallow. And, and it really then opens up massive breakthroughs where the things you're doing are so powerful and important that they actually have 10x potential. Yeah, that's awesome. And that leads us into the next thing that I wanted to have you guys explain that I loved in the book, and that is needs versus wants. So we can start with you, Dan, and then we'll head over to Ben, and then <laughs> we'll see what we get. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I've been coaching in uh, 2024, so it's uh, less than uh, two years now. I'll I will have been a coach for 50 years. So I started this in 1974. And I had been a writer in a big ad agency, BBDO, big uh, global ad agency. And uh, I, have good, I have good skills, um, but I don't have unique skills, okay? And, um, um, and so when we look at the activities that people are doing, um, we break them into four things that you, there are activities where you're actually incompetent and you actually lose energy from being involved in these activities. So for me, uh, any kind of backstage work that requires detail, like, uh, uh, you know, making sure all the details are right, uh, depletes me of energy. Okay. Anything that's front stage where I'm talking to um, actual uh, clients and customers and actually talking to prospects, um, I move immediately to my unique ability, okay? And you can just see the radical difference in the energy level between those two activities. And in between, there's one where you're confident. And oftentimes, I believe uh, when I travel uh, through airports, that I notice a lot of people are on their phones, okay? So even though they're traveling, they're actually at the office. And as a matter of fact, I think that technology has made it possible for people uh, to be working all the time, even when they're supposedly on vacation, they're still working. And uh, I remember one client, it was so vivid in my mind, and uh, he took a business call uh, during the baptism of his first daughter. And he said to his wife, this is really important. And that kind of told her how important she was, and it told her how important the new baby was. And uh, it came close, that incident, uh, over the next five or ten years. Just that one incident uh, put severe strain in their marriage because he took a business call uh, during it. And uh, he had s stood up in front of witnesses and said, you're the most important person in my life, and my children are the most pe important people in my life. But the moment he took a, somebody wanted to talk to him about business, that overrode uh, what he had said. And that's remembered. You know, that's, uh, the incidents like that are really remembered. And so, for example, I'll give you an example of a recent freedom that I've created with time. And it was July of uh, 2018, so it'll be five years this July. And um, I was just watching television one night, and I said, this is a really, really bad activity for me. I get nothing out of it, and it's gotten worse over the years. 
And uh, most of my, I was born in 1944, so I didn't even actually see television until I was about eight years old. So uh, I grew up on reading. I grew up on, um, you know, I grew up on, um, on um, um, radio and everything like that. And I grew up on a farm, so I had a lot of walking through the fields and woods. And then, you know, television came into my life, and it's an encroaching medium. You know, it keeps encroaching into your life. And that was when there were only three networks, but now there's 500 networks. And uh, the news used to be at, uh, you know, the news used to be at 6 o'clock at night. And then the TV station went off the air at 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock, and they were off. But now it's 24 7, 500 channels, and everybody's trying to get your attention. And I was giving my attention to uh, what I consider to be a worthless activity. So I, uh, I said, from now until Labor Day, I'm not going to watch any television. And um, I discovered that during those six weeks, the world got actually better. <laughs> and little did I know that my not, not watching television actually made the world better. <laughs> So I said, I wonder how long I can continue this. And so it'll be five years in July, and I haven't watched an hour of television. I haven't watched any television. And, um, and uh, then I calculated how many hours I freed up, and it turned out to be 800 hours a year. So it'll be 4,000 hours I freed up. My sleep is a lot better. Uh, one is I'm getting more sleep. And the other thing is I'm not going to bed frazzled from watching television. You know, um, te television has a lot, of, a, a lot of purposes, you know, from the uh, television point of view, but none of them are my purposes. <laughs> They're their, their purposes. So I just cut that out and people say, well, how do you stay informed? And I said, well, there's wonderful, uh, I like the internet and there's wonderful um, news platforms where they write really good articles, in-depth articles on recent events. So most people would not know that I don't watch television anymore because I'm very, you know, I, I'm very interested in world events. I'm very interested in things happening. So I'm just informed, but I got 800 hours back a year and I'm much more relaxed. I've got, um, you know, I just notice a real ease and Freedom has come into my schedule from not watching television, and that's just that's just one thing in my life where I got 800 hours a year back. And I don't know if I could have done the collaboration with Ben if I hadn't given up television. Well, I didn't. I didn't give up television. I gave up being aggravated, <laughs> of being constantly buzzed by television. And so I look at other things. I said, where where are things that you just have habitually do? And it had a reason for doing it at one time in your life. So I would say, uh, aside from the television example, I probably find 10 hours, 10 hours a quarter where I'm doing something. And I said, should I be the person doing this? Somebody else should be doing this, you know. And somebody who has enjoyment of the activity and is actually much better at the activity. So that's... Uh, that's uh, just a demonstration of the freedom. And more and more, I'm doing less of what I need to do to go back to Reed's question here. And most people have goals because they need, uh, they need the results of the goals, okay? And, for exa and I really notice it. Um, uh, I think the three toughest decades in my life were teen years, the 10 to 20 years. And the next one was 30 to 40. And the third one was 60 to 70. And at 60 or 70, you have to justify why you're continuing to work when um, other people are retiring. They said, well, why, why do you need to keep working? And an idea came to me. I, I, I'm not working because I need to. I'm working because I want to. And a book came out of that. It's called Wanting What You Want, that most people don't want what they want. They want what they need. And, uh, and, uh, and what I mean by that is they want something, but they feel they have to justify it. So they explain uh, what they want in terms, well, I need to do this. I see it. 
a lot with um, um, entrepreneurs who continue to work. That, that I just I just notice that people uh, uh, never go beyond need; they never get to want. So um, so people say, well. You don't want things just because you want them. And I said, well, why don't we start with that as the reason why you really want something is because you want it. And then you have to create a fiction of some sort to explain why you have to do it. And, uh, you know, at my point in life, why am I um, uh, creating a future that's bigger than my past at age 79? And I said, because I want to. <laughs> and they said, yeah, but why do you need it? I said, I don't need it. I don't need it at all. And they said, well, I mean, don't you have enough money? I said, I'm, I'm totally taken care of. Well, why, why do you want it then? And I said, I want it because I want it. And it's hard for a lot of people because they've been trained from birth that they have to justify their ambition. Yeah, I, I like I liked how Ben talked a little bit about that too, and and his perspective too, and it's it's I think it's really really good to have that concept that you want it because you want it, and you don't have to explain it to anybody else. And and when and and your example too, Ben, it, it made so much sense. You're like, this is what I want, and and that's it. You know. So. I mean, I mean, most people when they get married, they t if they want to have a lot of children, they take 25 years to have six children. But Ben wanted uh, six people, uh, six children right away, so he got six in five years. <laughs> I think I think Ben was even surprised about that. I'm not I'm not giving him credit for that. Now come on, Ben. You're not you're not saying that. I'm was not smart enough to I'm not smart enough to figure that one out. That was uh, that was that was <laughs> no, some crazy no, stuff. No, no, but uh, you know, uh, Ben, you can say whatever you want, but uh, I'm just looking at the inner Ben here. I'm not looking at the <laughs> Ben explaining himself. Ben, I'm, I'm saying, but you. Um, you know, um, um, I know it plays a big part of your enjoyment of life is having having the children, and uh, you just decided to uh, go full bore. <laughs> 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 no, nah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, um, this is actually the first time I, I read Dan's little book, um, and Dan puts out these little books for his clients, but I read his book, Wanting What You Want, and I just thought it was such a gorgeous philosophy and Dan basically just described it, you know, where people are operating out of perceived need or out of want. And uh, I think that in the world we're trained to just do what you think, you know, just do what you think you need, or even as hard as or, doing what other or, people think you. Or what's acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and back to the kind of core analogy that we used for the book, which was stripping away everything that's not the David. Um, to that whole idea of Michelangelo and taking really the whole notion of 10x is stripping away everything and, and there's a great concept uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous that all progress starts by telling the truth mm -hmm. and, and so I think that what's beautiful about this whole idea of, of 10x is really about stripping away everything that's not you know what's absolutely what you truly want which is from a psychological standpoint intrinsic motivation and freedom if you believe you're doing something because you have to then obviously you're not free because you think you have to and so the goal is is freedom, and freedom comes with choice, and, and and that directly ties to doing something because you genuinely want to, not because someone else is telling you to, not because you think you need to, and that <clears throat> level of freedom of choice is rarely taken, um, but it's deeply it's deeply encouraged <laughs> in this book, and I found that the more I just do what I you know want what I want, and I'm honest about it, uh, wow. that it really clears a lot of the clutter in life. And it allows you to strip away a lot of the things that are either imposed upon you or that you're imposing upon yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, people say, well, uh, what if everybody just did what they wanted? And I said, well, I'm not talking about everybody. I'm talking about myself here. And I said, and first of all, uh, uh, I grew up with a very, very powerful education in morality and ethics. Okay, so uh, I don't want anything for myself that um, um, I, I wouldn't want other people to also have for themselves. So I've got a internal, it's sort of the golden rule, re, golden rule reworded that I want constantly increasing freedom in my life, and I also want that for other people. 
you know. So, uh, but it, it can only be chosen from the inside. You can't choose from the outside something for someone else unless they want it on the inside. So I'm very respectful. And um, there's lots of things that other people want that wouldn't mean anything to me. And I think that um, the same goes for the things that I want. People say, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that. And I says, that's, that's good. I, 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 I have no problem with that. I was talking, I have um, seven, five siblings who are still alive and they're all in their 70s and 80s. And I remember about uh, 30 years ago, Babs and I uh, took off nine weeks and we went to Cape Cod. And uh, uh, one of my siblings said, well, it must be nice, must be nice to take nine weeks off. And I said, yeah, it really was. I said, I I think it was a little too much. I said, I I don't think I would I would do nine at a stretch. And she says, well, not everybody can do that. And I said, well, not everybody wants to. And it was an interesting discussion because um, she had a big family with a lot of children. And I said, not everybody wants to have seven children. And I said, that's not something I want. And you did. And she said, and it was kind of like, well, I had to, you know. And I said, well, you know, I, I'd give that a little bit deeper thought about that, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but but this this issue really, I find this one issue of the, uh, you know, of the concepts that are mentioned in the book really sorts people out. You know, are they really operating from their own internal sense of purpose or are they um, doing it for um, the acceptance of other people, and I, uh, and I, uh, and you know, I'm the only human being that I have direct access to. <laughs> exactly, that's a good way to look at it. And I, I love all these the, these con- concepts we've talked about, and it's like the tip of the iceberg. So you got to get this book; it's amazing. I'm telling you. Is there any final things you want to leave us with, Dan and Ben? Yeah, uh, I will say this. Uh, uh, I would never in uh, my thinking about who I am and how I op- operate would ever envision that I would have a major market book. I, I write a lot of small books, okay, because I have about a 90 90- Uh, I have about a 90 day tank of gas. And if the project isn't completed in 90 days, the chances are um, very, very slim or none that I will um, continue on with that project. You know, I'm I'm clinically diagnosed as ADD. And, uh, you know, and right down the road from you, uh, Reed, at Newport, uh, Daniel Amen. Yeah. has a clinic I went to his he's a friend of mine yeah. I, I went to his clinic and he said um, uh, uh, he said he said there's an amazing gap between how you say your life is led and what the tests say is going on in your head and <laughs> and he says you seem to lead a very very organized a very uh, stress-free life but uh, our test, our brain scans and all the other tests that Daniel and his team give you, he says there's a 10 ring circus going on there all the time. And, <laughs> and so how do, how do you explain this? And I say, and then I described my business. This is the wrap up call with a psychiatrist. And I, I described what the strategic coach and what the business is. And she says, well, I don't know who else you've created these thinking tools for, but you sure created them for yourself, you know. And um, and I did, but I find that a lot of entrepreneurs are more or less in the same territory with me. And there's lots of people, you know, who lead incredibly fr- uh, uh, frenetic business life. And, you know, what's going on in my head is my own business, and other people don't need to know that. Um, and uh, but uh, in terms of how I behave, I'm, I'm an easy person to get along with. Uh, you know, I'm very helpful. I uh, I collaborate really well, um, um, and everything. But I would just never have imagined having a major market book. And then one day I was at Genius Network, and a guy named Ben Hardy sat sat down next to me. And he says, you don't, you write all these little books, but you don't write a big book, a major market book. And I said, no, I just don't have a feel for it. 
And he said, well, if you ever wanted to write one, he said, I'd be interested in collaborating with you on it. And that's, uh, and so I, I'm just um, saying that just to put all the blame on Ben for the three, <laughs> for the, for the three books. And then I have to mention Tucker Max because Tucker was very instrumental in establishing the relationship with you, Reed, and with uh, Hay House. And uh, in my, you know, I, ne I never had any, what I would say, images of what it would be like to work with a publisher, but I can't imagine, um, I, I, I can't imagine under any circumstances I could have had a better experience than the one we've had with you, Reed. Well, thank you, Dan. That's very nice. And thank you, Ben, for writing them. Any final comments for you, Ben? Yeah, for those who are still listening, thank you. Love you. Uh, I hope you get the book and enjoy it. Uh, I had a blast writing it. And, you know, deep kudos to Hay House for publishing it and for Dan for all the brilliant thoughts and work that uh, you've done for the decades. It's beautiful. And I, I'm just uh, insanely grateful for the opportunity. I will say... Just to the idea of that 80-20, that um, when you actually get that call call to adventure, similar to the hero's journey, that call to adventure to a new level, to a new journey, um, that it's going to invite you to your, you know, how I would see it is it's going to invite you to your 10x future self. And that 10x future self is kind of like the David. Eventually, it's going to invite you to strip away all of your past self that no longer fits the David. And, um, and that's, you know... The 80 percent as we're describing it here and as we describe in the book you're gonna to have to let that stuff go a lot of it's the stuff that got you here and that call to adventure is what invites you to go deep and every time you you go through this process that we describe in this book you get closer and closer to that david stripping more and more of the layers away and it's just a beautiful beautiful process of getting to that place of freedom intrinsic motivation um high level capability collaborations those four freedoms that dan described in the beginning the increasing qualities and quantities of freedom of time money in the ways that you know you you make the money in the ways that you love and also that serve you and then just the the quality and tr of transformational relationships and just the increasing sense of purpose in your life and so i, I just think it's a, a beautiful process to go you know to go deeper and deeper into yourself but also to impact other people and um i think it gets you to the soul of who you are and so it's just a, a benefit and i really hope people enjoy it 